just to uh, get things moving, I'd like to start, Ian. In one of our sessions yesterday, we had a great discussion on the future of the workforce. And in that discussion, it was pointed out that the increasing trend is for more casual employees, contractors, and that's changing the nature of organisations. And that has social consequences. And I was thinking about the bank with your over 50,000 employees and the quite significant social infrastructure you would have to support those people. So I'm wondering how you're going to be planning the future workforce in that context. Uh, thanks. Um, the, the starting point to me is that although we speak a lot about technology and, and CEDA's own research last week talked about jobs that are going to end up being done by machines, etc. Um, at the core, business success and competitive advantage is still going to come from people. Um, the machines, at least in our lifetime, won't necessarily invent themselves and take over the world. So whatever business model you've got, the core of it is still going to be people. And so as a core skill and responsibility of an organisation, looking after your people is going to be no less important than it's ever been. In fact, it's probably going to be more important than it's ever going to be. At the same time, and, and all of us here who are employers in the room know that the expectations of people in terms of the companies, the way their companies approach them, the way they looked after, the way they thought about, is evolving, and they're they're expecting quite rightly uh, to be well looked after, socially responsible behaviour from the organisations, and that's increasingly factoring into their decisions about where to join and where to stay. So we've got to have an ongoing commitment to people and the social infrastructure around them. For us, we've put a lot of money and experimentation to the physical premises. Um, our uh, darling quarter. Uh, buildings now down, have got about 6,000 people in central Sydney and they're all configured for greater collaboration, greater use of technology. Uh, we've got our own child care centre again uh, opened in, in uh, the centre of Sydney. So those sorts of things are, are critically important and, and while we keep the focus on coding and technology etc, at the core of all this is still great people doing great work. Thank you. Over to the audience. Hello. Ian, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, Michael Keating, Editor-in-Chief of Inside Canberra here in the Federal Press Gallery. I wonder if we might switch to uh, some international news that's been dominating discussion here in Parliament of late, the signing of the uh, free trade agreement with China. I was just wondering your view, Ian, on uh, where do you think Australia can take advantage of that agreement and do you think all of the political noise around it is justified? From our point of view uh, as a company, uh, and also just as part of the Business Council, etc., I think the progress that's been made in recent times on free trade uh, in the region generally, China, Indonesia, India, Japan, Korea, are all positive developments for the country. Uh, because we have got to understand that as a, as a country of 20 million plus people, the net opportunities for us in opening up these overseas markets and being able to deliver uh, goods and services to people in those markets is net opportunity. Uh, so that's a very positive development. Now, with opening up your economy, obviously you can only, you've got to open it up both ways. And so with that carries risks. A lot, understandably, a lot of the debate around free trade agreements depends on whether you're a company that stands to be a net beneficiary relative to that country or a, uh, a net loser because of what that company's likely to be able to provide to your local economy. And I think it's very important for, for all of us and for our political leaders to get above that level of industry by industry discussion, take the view that a responsible open economy is the best path to Australia's prosperity, then understand if that's what we're going for, what some of the risks are to the local economy, and then help the local economy meet the transition to, through to some of those risks. But certainly our view is that the right response is not to say simply close the doors, uh, because that's really going to harm Australian companies and harm Australian prosperity. Table 8. Hi, Lynn Pizzullo, Deloitte Texas Economics. Um, I was going to ask a question about cyber security and as it particularly impacts on the financial services sectors. Um, so we have got a situation recently where one European country has actually published a study where they've said that the value of the internet 
is now a net negative for them because uh, the amount of resources they have to dedicate in terms of managing financial crimes and protecting their um, critical financial data actually exceeds um, the benefits that they perceive from internet banking and all the efficiencies from digital technology. Um, so I, I'm curious about this because we've always thought of new economy as being fundamentally enabled by uh, digital technology and in fact it continuing to reduce costs and I'm just intrigued by what, how the bank is responding in Australia um, to these issues and how you see the future in terms of managing those risks, whether they'll in fact continue to be enablers or whether it will in fact become more prob problematic than it's worth. Uh, well, the short answer is, in our view, cyber security is a core skill of a financial institution today and will be into the future. And we've got to see it as fundamentally as we see managing credit risk. It's that important. Um, our own cyber council, the Commonwealth Bank, I chair personally. Uh, it's not delegated to a member of my team. We have overseas experts participating in that. Um, to take a step back, though, undoubtedly when we look at financial services, digital, the internet, whatever you want to call it, is great for customers. It increases ease, it increases transparency, it's cheaper, uh, it's undoubtedly good for customers, A, and B, there's no putting the genie back in the bottle even if you didn't believe that, so this is here to stay. So from our perspective, rather than saying is this a net positive or a net negative, our view is we must embrace it, we must get to the forefront of it. A big part of that is making sure the front end is industry leading, We've also got to get the back end right to make sure the processes are good. But in addition to all the really cool stuff that people see, Combank apps and our new merchant terminal, et cetera, behind that is a really deep focus on cyber, uh, cyber security. And we're spending tens of millions of dollars on that every year. Uh, it's something we take extremely seriously and we're just going to need to get better and better and better at it because it's a core skill of the bank. Our customers expect it and we've got to be good at it to continue uh, strengthening the trust that they put in us. A question here at the front. opportunities that exist for the development of quantum computing? Yeah, but the answer is both. I mean, <laughs> the, the sad news when you're a uh, big organisation as we are, a big incumbent as people like to call us, is uh, risk and opportunity are two sides of the same coin. Now, quantum computing, uh, we've been very clear that we've made a small investment in this. Actually, A, because we think that uh, in, a, in a world of fast computing and big data, it can help our business. So there's a, there's a strong business justification for it. But B, actually, uh, we found that the work that was being done in the area of quantum computing in Australia had the potential actually to be world leading. Uh, and often we look at these things and we have a view of, gosh, we can't believe that ever in Australia we would be world leaders on something that's not a sport. Um, actually, here we are with quantum computing, which is one of the real major potential disruptive forces in computing in the future, uh, in computing memory, speed of processing, speed of big data, etc. And we saw this and said, look, let's just make an investment in it so it happens. Now, it's our shareholders' money, so we've got to have a good business justification to be responsible for it, but the fundamental view we had is that this can change business, including ours. Uh, Australia can be at the forefront, and therefore, to the extent we could help it happen, we were happy to do so, and that's something we've got an ongoing interest in. Ian, one of the earlier sessions today was looking at the issue of productivity, and Peter Harris put up a slide showing productivity going all in the wrong direction, other than one slide that he put up which showed productivity gains in the financial services sector, and we all got very excited when we saw that, and then he qualified it by saying that that was principally driven by pricing decisions around interest rate changes. But of course, given financial services sector is going to have a very important role in leading the transition to the new economy, um, how do you get sustainable productivity improvements without compromising customer service or governance? Um, the, the first uh, aspect of this is you've got to decide what productivity means for you as an institution. Now, I haven't seen the data that you're referring to, but uh, for many years, as a bank and as a financial services sector, we talked about the cost to income ratio, which roughly is the percentage of cost versus the percentage of revenue. 
Now, as that goes down, you say to yourselves, gosh, we're getting more productive, but it could be explained by the fact that you're earning more revenue, uh, and that is not being more productive. So from our perspective at the uh, Commonwealth Bank, we've taken the view that being more productive actually is a matter of life or death in this economy. It's not a nice to have, not month to month, but over the next five years. And we measure it at the process level based on unit cost, error rates, turnaround time, and throughput by process. And we, what we want to see is that process by process, unit costs are going down, error rates are going down, throughput's going up. Um, now, once you get that productivity through, then obviously you've got a more productive cost base, and then the decision always comes as a business, how much of that do you put towards dropping prices versus taking margin? Every person running a business here has various versions of that same decision and that's dictated by, among other things, customer expectations in the competitive environment. Over the, even the short term, certainly the medium to long term, and certainly in an age of greater transparency driven by uh, the internet, we have a view as a business that transparency is going up, customers want value, and therefore if you're not prepared to provide value over the long term, you won't survive. So there's no benefit in getting a lot more productive if all you're going to do is use that to have disaffected customers and ultimately you'll have no business. Question down the back. Thank you very much for uh, your remarks about foreign investment. Uh, my name is Roger Hausman and I also work with the Geneva Press Club. Now, as you know, internationally, Australia is still very much seen as a frontier country and recently uh, we saw the release of the Northern Australia Development Plan. Does the CBA or Commonwealth Bank have any specific approach to actually try to support that policy? And also, how do you see the development in Australia, which still seems to suffer from the fact that people from the country move to the cities, mm. whereas the comparative advantage from an international perspective is that Australia actually has a bigger advantage in agribusinesses and other related uh, food processing areas than any other country in the world. Yet uh, the big four banks, uh, I have to say, looking at the statistics, uh, are very reluctant to invest in that sector. Um, first of all, I think your, the fundamental thesis behind your point about Australia uh, I'd agree with, which is one of the um, challenges of Australia is that it's blessed with such a stunning eastern and western seaboard and never wants to be there. Um, now, the, the cities of, of the eastern and western seaboard are major contributors to the economy. Uh, they need to be strengthened, etc. But the opportunities in the country are significantly beyond just the strips on the east and the west coast. And I was speaking to somebody at the Business Council today about my last visit to Darwin. And the economic energy in Darwin is extraordinary. And you notice when you speak to our staff in the branch and you go to uh, our branches in Darwin on a Monday morning and you say, how was your weekend? They say, "Thank it was great, thanks, I was up in Bali. Um, it, you know, the flight was an hour and I went there and back. When were you last in Sydney? Oh, maybe five years ago. So just the geographic proximity of that part of Australia to a lot of the regions that we're talking about in and of itself uh, demands greater thought. In terms of your comments about agriculture, uh, undoubtedly um, it's an important part of Australia's future comparative advantage. Uh, the country, the economic effects that I talked about include the fact that those countries want to consume more food, consume more protein, etc. That's a net opportunity for Australia and for New Zealand where we have a business. Now there's been a lot of discussion about uh, financial institutions credit appetite in agriculture and I'd be the first to admit that over time the sector and indeed the Commonwealth Bank has been a bit patchy uh, in its attitudes to the sector because it's tended to want to lend when times are great and then when times are not so great it has to unwind a lot of that lending and credit tightens up. Um, I, in my previous role before I uh, was the CEO, I was head of the business bank under which the Agribank sat. Uh, I've spent time in um, mustering helicopters above beef farms in Queensland. And what I've noticed there, and I've spoken to families, is that you've got to be conservative lending in the sector, but you've also got to lend through the cycle. So yes, we do have an appetite to do it, but what we have a responsibility to do is make sure it's good lending and it's able to withstand fluctuations through the cycle, so that when those fluctuations occur, all the lenders can afford to stick with the farmers because they deserve the assistance. Thank you, Ian. 
And thanks to you, trustees, for your contributions to our discussion. But it is time to bring this luncheon session to a close. And I'd like to invite Professor Martin back to the stage. <laughs>